Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming along to this uh, session of the Quick Bites Talks. Um, my name's Jennifer Byrne. I'm from the Children's Cancer Research Unit out at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Um, and I'll, I'm here to talk to you about uh, peer review, some challenges for scientific peer review, and some solutions. So firstly, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm from the, this particular unit that we call the CCIU. So it's out at Westmead, and we're a group of researchers that study childhood cancer, so about 30 of us. Um, and in particular, so I've been doing cancer research since, I suppose, the uh, late 80s, which is quite a long time. And my current research encompasses a number of topics. Um, one of those topics is uh, how neutral lipid is stored in cells and the relevance of that in cancer cells. So we published a paper last year on that and a more recent commentary here. We also do research into how cancer biobanks operate, given that a lot of our research is dependent upon um, cancer biospecimens. So we've written um, some original publications in that field. We also write reviews. So we've written quite a lot of reviews around the function of genes that we've identified and around molecular profiling of childhood cancer. So I guess we work on a few different things, try to publish fairly um, regularly. And I'm also um, an, a subject editor in this particular journal, which is um, International Journal for Biological Markers, which is published in Germany. So I've been acting as a subject editor, a, a specialist editor for that journal um, for the last couple of years. So. Um, just to give you an outline of the talk, it's probably only going to be about half an hour or a bit less. I'm just going to give a very brief introduction into peer review. And then I'm going to be introducing some of the problems that um, can lead to issues in peer review, such as research over overload and information overflow. And then I'll talk briefly about um, the role of literature reviews in terms of dealing with information overflow and some other solutions. So just to, I guess, give a very brief introduction to peer review, this, um, this figure comes from a, a survey that was published this year. And there was a result of a survey into peer review attitudes conducted by the scientific publisher Wiley. And it was published in a journal called Learned Publishing. So uh, this, I this peer review, uh, I think, re uh, received responses from nearly 3,000 researchers. And it revealed that the burden, the I suppose burden is perhaps the wrong word, but um, re US researchers were conducting a disproportionate amount of peer review. And in total, they calculated that there was 22 million researcher hours spent reviewing for the top 12 publishing, you know, journals, sorry, publishing houses, which is clearly, you know, a tremendous effort that's being expended in this activity of peer review. And it concluded that there's certainly a need to expand the review uh, pool, particularly in high growth and emerging markets and amongst early career researchers. So really peer review, I think if many of you will recognise that this is an activity that we all conduct, if not daily, almost weekly, when you have um, a long-term career in science. And I sort of view review as a, a verb that can be used, you know, passively and actively. I review, I am reviewed. And over time, if you stay in science increasingly, you oversee the peer review activities of others. If, for example, you become a journal editor or if you're on a grant review panel, for example, for the NHMRC. I suppose uh, despite the fact that peer review is, is such an everyday activity and it's so vital to our lives, you know, whether or not our publications are accepted relies largely upon how they're reviewed and similarly whether or not grants are funded rests heavily upon the opinion of peer reviewers. Yet we all know, I think, that peer review doesn't work very well or certainly doesn't work as well as we would like it to work. And I think part of that issue is we don't really talk much about peer review. However, we do laugh about it, and we can laugh about it. So I thought I'd just show you a couple of cartoons, some of which you've seen before, and you'll probably recognise some of the sentiments here. So this is most scientists regarding the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement. I think everybody's kind of felt that feeling when, when you get to the end, that you've kind of been um, attacked using various implements along the way. And this is a cartoon showing um, how your manuscript is submitted is converted to something quite different, often through the process of peer review, even though that's um, <laughs> probably not entirely intentional on anybody's behalf. Anyway, so I think partly um, one of the reasons why peer review isn't working as well as it could is because we don't really talk about it much, and perhaps that's because we don't value it enough. 
There are researchers that study peer review, um, again, perhaps not as many as you might imagine, and peer reviews also prove to be quite a frustrating activity to actually research and therefore improve. But there are certainly um, direct threats to peer review that I'm going to talk about a little bit. And that is, firstly, I'll talk a little bit about the rising rates of competition in science and partly how those lead to both researcher and then information overload and overflow. So it's probably no, survi no surprise to most people in this audience that researchers are increasingly fighting for their survival and that of their teams. And this leads to, I guess, uh, increasing stress upon researchers to constantly produce either manuscripts, grant applications, both. And ironically, of course, that very activity leads to increased demand upon peer reviewers. Um, because it's very difficult to actually assess publication quality, that's something that you know, different people will have different opinions about. Increasingly, output is measured just simply through counting, either counting grants, dollars, or publications. And it's been shown that publication counting leads to probably many undesirable outcomes, none of which are intended. Um, these have been described as things such as um, publishing the smallest, dividing your data into the smallest publishable unit, which is also termed salami slicing. And also publications that have been described as hit and run publications, where basically researchers want to put out a large publication, get a lot of attention, and then move on before that body of work is actually validated or followed up in any way. So in this increasingly um, demanding environment that we all find ourselves in, peer review is often just being put really to the side as something that's done at the last minute, at the end of the day, at night, really, when and if time allows. And I guess, um, you know, if you're interested in this issue about competition in science, here's a couple of papers that you might want to look at, although I would suggest that you don't look at them at a time when you're feeling a bit bleak, because particularly the first one is really quite a depressing document. Um, this was the, the result of focus groups interviews that were, I think were conducted um, probably about 10 years ago now and were published in 2007. And a more recent commentary by um, Ferrick Fang and Arturo Casadeval in infection and immunity, more broadly con considering whether or not competitive science is actually ruining science. And as an editor of a journal, I guess, I've recently encountered some of the difficulties in actually uh, obtaining the right peer reviewer for the right manuscript. I would say that on average for each paper that I review, I probably contact about 10 peer reviewers and uh, the vast majority of those refuse to review the paper. Uh, most recently, one of the comments was that this particular individual no longer reviewed for publications that had an impact factor of less than X. And that's very challenging if you're actually an editor of a journal with an impact factor of less than X. You know, all of these publications still need to be reviewed. So this indicates that people are really overwhelmed by requests to peer review and increasingly um, being more strategic in their own view as to how they spend their time. And of course, overload is compounded by the fact that we are all increasingly busy and part of this is because of increasing amount of time spent complying with regulations and administration. And I feel a little bit like an evangelist, but almost every talk that I give recently, I highlight this particular publication that, that came out late last year, Academic Clinical Research, Death by a Thousand Clicks. And one of the um, projects within our group, we hope for next year, will actually be trying to um, do some work to partly resolve some of the discrepancies in terms of governance requirements around research here in New South Wales. So publication growth um, is actually rising exponentially. This graph looks quite benign, but it's actually the predicted, an ex predicted exponential curve surrounded by raw values of publications from 1980 to 2010. And it does look fairly benign, but I think everybody can realise that an exponential growth in publications is a big problem from a lot of points of view, not, not least from peer review. And this study, uh, also from 2015, highlights the fact that this exponential rise applies across the board, regardless of whether you're considering biological publications, mathematics, chemistry, physics, etc. So basically, all of these, in all of these disciplines, publications are rising at an exponential rate. Because there are so many publications, of course, there are more and more journals, and I think a previous Quick Bytes talk might have dealt with the issue of predatory publishing and the fact that m there are many more journals available today, and not all of those journals are following academic models of peer review. 
um, such as some of the journals that are on Beale's list of predatory open access publishers. And I think that there's quite now quite a lot of um, educational material out on the internet to advise people about the existence of these kinds of journals and ways in which um, people submitting manuscripts can distinguish um, a legitimate journal from one whose um, motivations might be primarily around um, profit as opposed to um, academic um, communication. This has also been highlighted by a recent uh, spoof paper. This was actually published in 2013 where um, John Bohannon from Science concocted a spoof publication and submitted that very widely to a large number of journals. And many of these journals accepted that publication, indicating again that their peer, peer review practices were probably not up to scratch. Most recently, um, and this is probably something that perhaps fewer people are aware of, uh, some authors are actually nominating uh, for email addresses um, that are supposedly linked to people that could peer review the paper that actually track back to that author or their, their own colleagues. And that uh, has led to a large number of retractions and an increasing number of journals actually preventing authors from suggesting possible peer reviewers. So journals are increasingly using either their own editors or their own reviewers to review papers, but clearly that makes that process more challenging as well. So um, all of this you know, increased amount of information is essentially leading to a situation that's been termed overflow in the social sciences. And I first encountered this term when I read this article that was published in eLife in 2015, which was largely the result of um, a series of interviews with um, senior biological researchers and how they're really dealing with the fact that now there is simply too much information to process. Even if you were to read the literature 24-7, which clearly none of us do, you, you just simply cannot keep up with the information that's available to academics to, to process. So just in summary, you know, increasing numbers of researchers, different ways of doing science, combined with this kind of publish or perish culture where we need, um, increasingly we're looking at uh, publication quotas being used either tacitly or implicitly, combined with increasing number of scientific journals is leading to this situation where we have peer review overload, leading to poor quality science being published, but the equally problematic situation of good science being ignored. And clearly that's leading to an enormous amount of wasted resources, both in terms of researchers pursuing poor science and also ignoring what's good. And those wasted researchers are clearly human resources but also valuable financial resources, which I think we'd all agree we can't afford to waste. So I suppose in view of this situation of overflow, um, literature reviews represent one possible antidote to this situation. If everybody hasn't got the time to read all of the literature, then perhaps some of the people have got time to read most of it and then write about that in the form of a literature review. So one of the descriptions that I found about literature reviews that I particularly liked was the analysis of the past to prepare for the future. So literature reviews have always really served as trusted summaries of research. Um, they're read by content experts, so people that already know a lot about a field but want to read a literature review because they want to hear somebody else's perspective. They want to make sure that they haven't missed anything, but nonetheless they might know quite a lot about the field. But increasingly I think lit literature reviews are also read by people that know almost nothing about the topic at hand. And certainly I've med read many literature reviews when I've known absolutely nothing about that particular topic. I'm actually reading that literature review to make a decision as to whether I need to keep reading or whether I need to move on. And some examples of what I kind of call fly-in, fly-out researchers, that, that kind of situation where you're triaging results, where you're trying to make a decision about where your own research is going. But in addition, literature reviews are read by newcomers to the field who intend to stay, such as students, such as early career researchers, people starting a new postdoc, they'll often start at a literature review and get a feel for where they need to go. So literature reviews really need to fulfil two needs. They need to be reliable because people are going to believe what's written there and possibly take action based upon what's written in a literature review. But the information also needs to be accessible and available to people that aren't contact experts in that field. And so when I started to think about the peer review of literature reviews, I realised that the peer review needs to reflect these two needs. So essentially, literature reviews are a little bit like public transport. It has to be reliable, it has to be accessible, otherwise it's not much point. So just before I start to talk a bit more about um, you know, my, my work in terms of the peer review of literature reviews, I'll just tell you a little bit about the subtypes of literature reviews. When I started 
doing this project. I actually didn't know, I didn't know very much about this at all, but I very quickly became aware of the fact that literature reviews are largely divided into two areas. There are the narrative literature reviews and the systematic reviews. And certainly there are um, diagrams available such as this one that indicates that the level of confidence in these reviews is not equal. Systematic reviews are viewed to be the gold standard of evidence synthesis, whereas narrative reviews can be view viewed to be, you know, not certainly not at that same level. Um, and there's a lot of discussion in the, in the literature about ways in which we can actually improve the confidence in the, res in the description of research in narrative reviews. So despite this, um, the fact that narrative reviews are viewed fairly poorly in some quarters, they are the bulk of reviews that are published. So this particular diagram comes from um, uh, this article, I think, pertained to social work. But nonetheless, in many other fields, such as biological fields, there are very few systematic reviews. And that's partly because not all topics can be sub subjected to the systematic methodology. So narrative reviews still really play a very important role in terms of summarising uh, research findings. So partly in, re in response to a, a query of a past student of mine who wrote to me asking for some advice about how to review a literature review for the first time, I basically decided to write a, a guide because I couldn't find anything sitting out there in the literature, either, either in the published literature or even on the wider internet. So I published this article about six weeks ago, and just to sort of run through very quickly the points that the article raises, one of the first things that a peer reviewer needs to do is really work out whether the literature review justifies its place in the literature, because if there are a large numbers of poor literature reviews, they're probably contributing to the problem that they're trying to solve. Some fields are heavily reviewed and some fields are probably under-reviewed. And another early point is to really think about whether the, the authors have actually defined how they've performed their literature searches. Clearly this is a key factor in the production of systematic reviews, but it's too often um, not done in narrative reviews. So in terms of the question of whether or not the review is really needed, um, I've referred showing this diagram from um, a how-to guide of how to actually write a literature review. So if we consider the amount of published research versus the amount of literature reviews, where those two factors are low, there might be a need for a literature review to actually identify additional research questions. When you've got huge amounts of published research matched by a large number of reviews, you may actually need to have a review of reviews. So clearly the contribution of a literature review will partly depend upon how many of these types of publications already exist. Now, if you're a content expert reviewer, if you're somebody that's being asked to review a literature review that you know a lot about, you can have some particular contributions. You can really check for the citation breadth and, and balance and whether or not the review is, you know, considering all of the opinions that exist in the field or really going down a particular track. You can also at least do something towards determining whether or not information is being correctly summarised. I've certainly seen, um, you know, in the introduction sections of papers or in literature reviews, some completely inaccurate comments in my own field, linking of statements to, you know, publications that have got absolutely nothing to do with each other. And clearly those kinds of errors are not the sorts of errors that somebody who's reading a literature review from a more naive perspective will be able to pick up. Um, it's also a good idea to check that original references have been cited and they've been cited correctly and to consider whether or not the studies have just been really described verbatim or whether there's been some critical analysis that's been exerted in terms of summarising the findings. Um, in terms of um, broader things that peer reviewers can do, and you don't necessarily need context expertise to do these things, is to really think about whether there's enough figures and tables and whether there might be more effective ways of summarising information as opposed to just summarising it in the text, and really actively asking whether or not this review is going to help somebody who's, tr who's entering the field or reading the literature review from the perspective of someone who doesn't know anything about this topic. Probably the most difficult things that literature reviews um, need to achieve is to really expand the body of knowledge. Literature reviews should ideally be more than just the sum of a whole range of research studies. They should be predicting where a field needs to go. They should be perhaps highlighting unanswered questions. And for a peer reviewer, that, it can be difficult to identify um, you know, whether or not the, the, the review is really achieving that. But that's, I think, a very important thing to think about. 
And of course, in terms of reviewing literature reviews, there's many generic rules for reviewing manuscripts that have been very well described, such as you know, allocating appropriate time, avoiding conflicts of interest, um, you know, and, and all of that information actually can be obtained in, in some other articles that I cited in this particular review. So just in summary, I guess the main points I've listed here, and if these are followed, I think a lot of these should improve the scientific integrity of the information that's presented, but many of these will also improve the accessibility of the review and, where, and its ability to be, to be understood by somebody who may not be a content expert in that field. So, um, so just coming back to this uh, peer review survey that was conducted in 2016. So it, at this survey con, um, concluded that um, there's clearly a need to increase the reviewer pool, but also the majority of reviewers that were actually surveyed um, in this study, I think about 76%, indicated that they would welcome further training support, that they felt that they hadn't received adequate amount of training in terms of you know, undertaking peer review. I think most people really just start reviewing, really, often without a lot of help. So I found that quite interesting. So in terms of the solutions, clearly we need more peer reviewers. And interestingly, um, research studies that have investigated the quality of peer reviewing and have tried to pin that to particular features of peer reviewers have consistently identified the fact that younger peer reviewers tend to produce better quality reviews than older reviewers. Now, it's not known why that is. Um, various ideas have been raised, such as, of course, cognitive decline during ageing. Um, it's been proposed that perhaps that could reflect um, more up-to-date peer reviewer training, indeed perhaps more up-to-date understanding of research in general. Could it be that younger reviewers are comparatively less busy and have adequate time? Could they be less cranky? Could it be all of the above? It, it probably is. So in a sense, the solutions to this issue are, include all of you here today, younger people that would like to get involved in peer review. But clearly peer reviewers both need and want training, but at the moment a lot of that training is really a one-size-fits-all approach largely geared towards the review of original manuscripts. And yet you know, other forms of literature, such as literature reviews and the many subtypes within that genre, also require peer review and probably some more focused training. And I'd also argue that we probably need more discussion of peer review here at the University of Sydney, given that it's something that we all engage with and something that really impacts upon our lives. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd just like to thank Joy very much for um, organising the talk today and members of my team and in particular my past student who really, um, I guess, got me started on this topic in the first place. Thanks very much. <laughs>